Norman Powell and John Wall have gone from playoff rivals in Toronto and Washington to primary supporting cast members around Kawhi Leonard and Paul George in LA. After Kawhi's ACL tear and in the midst of his rehab, the Clippers significantly upgraded their roster by trading for Norman Powell and Robert Covington and signing 2017 All-NBA player John Wall. In just 25 minutes of action against Denver, UCLA product and NBA champion Norman Powell scored 34 points. A game before that, 2010's number one overall pick John Wall resembled the vintage version of himself, posting 20 points in 20 minutes. The Clippers may have choked Game 7 against the Nuggets back in the bubble, but last year, with the 2019 Finals MVP being injured for the entire season, you can't accurately judge LA for 2022's disappointment. The Claw, the Fun Guy, the Cyborg, whatever you want to call him, Kawhi Leonard is the prototype number one option for a team to have. Meanwhile, next to Russell Westbrook and Derrick Rose, John Wall is one of the most athletic point guards not only of this era, but of all time. With how he's crossing up defenders, stopping on a dime, and pulling up for middies like the mid-2010s version of himself, the Kentucky alumni looks 100%. The LA Clippers have become extremely well-rounded in the post-Chris Paul, Blake Griffin era, but question is, will 2023 be the year for the Clippers to finally break their infamous franchise curse? I'll answer that question coming up. Right before that, subscribe if you haven't already to help the channel reach 100k, leave a like on this video to help it spread to more people, and support the development of this platform even further by following the channel on Instagram and Twitter at dflowhoops. Thanks for any bit of support. It must be tough to be a Clippers fan. It's a fan base that's had to endure watching their team choke a 19-point second-half lead to a Josh Smith, Dwight Howard-led unit for the Houston Rockets back in 2015. When the two were in LA, prime CP3 and newest Boston Celtic Blake Griffin would tease everyone with success during the regular season, then suffered injuries time after the other in the playoffs. The untimely nature in which those predictable injuries would consistently take place can only be attributed to one thing, the so-called Clipper curse. A year after trading Blake Griffin and two years after trading Chris Paul, the Clips made good use of the assets they'd acquired in those trades in the summer of 2019. However, despite stealing the San Diego-born Kawhi Leonard from the Raptors in 2019, and trading Shea Gilgis Alexander, Danilo Gallinari, and five first round picks to the Oklahoma City Thunder in exchange for Paul George, the team's luck didn't get any better. Next, the Clippers suffered their second blown 3 1 series lead of the last half decade, this time in the bubble at the hands of the Denver Nuggets. With all that said, it's not all bad news for this franchise, at least for the time being. And there's reason to believe that the Clippers are ready to prove they're capable of breaking their curse in 2022-23. Of course, we're all thinking, here we go again. But to be fair, this upcoming campaign will be the very first season where 2016 championship coach for the Cleveland Cavaliers in Tyron Liu will knock on wood, have a healthy core of players to work with. When Doc Rivers was in charge of this new look Clippers team, it became clear he wasn't the right fit mentally for the team's personnel. And I'm not one who believes Doc is the bad coach everyone makes him out to be, but Rivers is just a better fit personality-wise with Philadelphia's All-Stars, more so than he was with the Clippers All-Stars. With all due respect, Rivers was a leftover from the previous era, who the front office should have cut ties with once the Leonard and George era began. That's not to blame Doc for what happened in that blown lead to Denver, but it doesn't help when your top players aren't fully on the same page as their head coach. There were two primary factors to blame for that series loss to the mile high. A, Paul George not fully embracing his role as the number two option, and B, the Clippers not having nearly enough help around Kawhi and Paul George. Good news is, those factors aren't going to be present for this current Clipper team, you're going to find out why in a minute. But first, let's address what went so wrong in this team's one and only playoff run when fully healthy. In the bubble playoffs, Kawhi averaged 28.2 points per night and George averaged 20.2, but no other player on the team outside of Lou Williams, who's currently out of the league, averaged even 12 points per game. That's simply not going to cut it if you're going to make a deep playoff run. In terms of George not fully embracing the role as the number two guy, 
I made that point because PG only took three less field goal attempts per night than Kawhi and took three more attempts from three point range than Leonard did in 2022's postseason. Conversely, under coach Tyron Lue, who's evidently had the ear of this Clippers team since taking over after Doc's firing, former MVP candidate Paul George is now willing to take a Dwayne Wade-esque step back into the number two option. Here's PG's take on that. You look at the wing wing with D Wade and uh, LeBron, um, you know, listen, Kawhi is the number one, um, and I'm totally fine with that. Um, I think I tried to, you know, I guess, compliment him with being able to, to take the load off of him. Um, you know, everybody say, you know, Kawhi, you are one in one, one A, one B. I'm, I'll publicly say you know, I'm the two. You know, Kawhi's the one. I'm the two. So that part we nipped in the bud. Like, there's no ego when it comes to that. Um, but with that being said, like, I believe in my talent and what I can do. And, you know, I believe on any night, you know, of, of what I'm capable of. Um, but I feel my job is to make everybody better. Um, that's what I try to do on the floor, just make the game easy for everybody. Uh, whether it's creating, uh, or just being aggressive, period, and, and making reads off that. Um, and so I think, you know, we'll go a long way, um, you know, if everybody just know their role and know what, we're, what we bring to the table. Um, yeah, I mean, everything else is easy. We just roll, it, roll the ball out and we get after it. In addition to that much-needed acceptance of his role from Paul George, the Clippers have shored up their depth issue, which was probably their biggest deterrent from the bubble. First, LA stole Norman Powell from the Portland Trailblazers by only giving up Eric Bledsoe, Justice Winslow, Keon Johnson, and the 2025 second round pick. Norm was a nice two-way secret weapon for Toronto in their championship run, as he played in 23 of 24 playoff games for the 2019 Raptors. Powell is one of the best slashers in the NBA, with a precise understanding of how to use angles. On top of that, Norm's handle, sneaky strength, and off-ball acumen make him tough to stay in front of. Powell's had those abilities since college, but it's amazing how much his three-point shot, and most recently, his in-between game, have upgraded over the years. For example, in the playoffs as a rookie, Norm was a 27% three-point shooter, but by his final postseason in Toronto, he was an elite 43% shooter from distance. Norm only played five games for the Clippers after being traded there last season, but was insanely effective in them, putting up 21.4 points on nearly 55% shooting from three-point range. Powell also made an unheard of 71.4% of his attempts from 10 to 16 feet last year, according to Basketball Reference, which, albeit in a small sample size, would be an exact 40% increase from that area on the floor compared to his rookie year. The 29-year-old continues to add new elements to his game year in, year out, as Norman Powell continues to prove he's one of the better players in the NBA who's never made the All-Star team. As a Raptors fan who still roots for him, it's good to see Powell showing out in the preseason. The man looks to be at 100%. Speaking of being at full strength, when John Wall is attacking downhill and embracing the contact like he's been in this year's preseason, you know the five-time All-Star is in shape. Staying healthy will be the biggest concern for Wall, but assuming that happens, his pass-first nature, ability to push the pace relentlessly in transition, and perfectly pick his spots by scoring when you need him to, is a solid fit next to Kawhi and PG. If Paul George is relating his role to D. Wade in 2012, then there's one player Wall can compare his role to, that's Kyle Lowry. Lowry was the perfect playmaker slash catch and shoot guy who relieved pressure from Kawhi during the championship run, and having watched John for his entire career, I can tell you from watching him early on that he has more than enough left in the tank, at least physically, to play that Kyle Lowry role. Question is, can he be the leader that Kyle was? Can he be the consistent deep range threat that Kyle was? Because for the sake of the Clippers floor spacing, he's going to have to be. I love the focus, intensity, and flashiness that Wall's displaying so far. He's making cross-court dimes, letting the game come to him, hitting open looks, and even showing off his patented behind-the-back layup at 100 miles per hour. He may not be getting as far off the ground, but Wall's evidently just as fast and shifty as he's ever been. 
Johns only received 14 minutes per game in three preseason outings, given he's getting back after a year off, but he's averaged 11 points in that limited playing time on 47% shooting from the field and 40% from three. Additionally, Wall's true shooting percentage in this year's preseason is at an elite 66.7% mark. But in your opinion, does Wall's preseason prove he's back to full form? Two commenter shoutouts next video. Thanks for watching.